It's a rainy day here in Hastings on Hudson, New York, but that didn't stop me from making this podcast. I want to talk a little bit about our culture and the consolidation of the book business. Why is it news if a huge book publisher, the biggest in America, buys another big book publisher from a different conglomerate? What has shifted in the world that makes this matter or not matter? Well, let's begin with this. Book publishers have been running an industry for over a hundred years. And the structure of the industry is based on a few facts. The first one is that books are returnable, completely returnable. The bookstore can keep a book for months or over a year, and if it doesn't sell, they can send it back. They've made it ever easier for them to do that. They don't even have to send the book back. In many cases, they can just scan in the code, and it's an honor system. Why would book publishers have such a ridiculous policy? They do it because the booksellers had a lot of power. They had a lot of power because there's a scarce amount of shelf space. There's only room for 20, 30, 50,000 books in a bookstore, and there are hundreds of thousands of books trying to get in there. So what the publishers realized a really long time ago is that their customer is not the reader. Their customer is the bookstore. That's why you will not find Random House's phone number on any of the books on your shelf, because they don't want you to call them. They don't want to hear from you at all. On the other hand, their sales force knows by name every buyer at every bookstore that sells a lot of books. That they have organized the entire industry around making booksellers happy. They have a long lead time. They had salespeople who would go from store to store. They try to publish books that booksellers want to publish. But, you've already figured out the but, one by one, independent booksellers are under stress or are disappearing, and it's all going to one company. One company, Amazon, that doesn't really care about books. Amazon has built an institution that is good at selling everything, but has no ability to sell anything. What do I mean by that? Well, most retailers have merchants. Merchants are human beings who make decisions, who have taste, who decide what's going to be in the front of the store and what's not. Merchants are the people who determine that Pottery Barn feels different than Macy's because they have put their point of view on display. And merchants had a lot of power at booksellers. That's because the books that got promoted ended up getting sold. That one example of this is the work that Jean Fywell did with her team at Scholastic. They took a big risk when they acquired Harry Potter in the United States, and Harry Potter ended up being the most profitable book franchise in history because independent booksellers went out of their way to get precocious 10-year-olds to read this new book from this unknown author. Hand-selling, it's called. And this mindset that booksellers helped publishers adopt is a mindset that publishers brought to Amazon. Let's put our best salespeople on Amazon. Let's figure out how to get Amazon excited about what we're launching next. Let's do all sorts of favors for Amazon because we know that Amazon will like that, and then Amazon will promote what we do. But the thing is, Amazon doesn't do that. Amazon is simply an engine, an algorithm. It listens to what the market wants in the short run, and it gives it to the market. Amazon doesn't buy 10,000 or 50,000 copies of a new book. They buy a three-day supply, a five-day supply. If it sells, they buy more. If it doesn't sell, they don't buy more. The people who work at Amazon don't have the levers to change things the way the people at other stores did. Years ago, I retained the rights to the audio CD of my book, The Dip. I read it myself, and I published it myself. I then made one call to somebody I knew at Barnes & Noble, and I said to them, let's do this. I'll give you an extra big discount. You'll put it in a big table near the cash register. It's final sale. We'll do one big batch. No reorders. Let's go. And we ended up selling tens and tens and tens of thousands of copies of a CD for not very much money. 
Barnes & Noble knew it was a good deal for their readers because it was so inexpensive. I knew that I could lay off the risk, and I knew that Barnes & Noble, through promotion, would sell them all. So back to this idea of consolidation. What is publishing? Publishing is the hard work of bringing a new idea to people who want to pay for it. Publishing is not printing. The logistics of printing are now available to anyone. Sure, it takes a little bit of time and some money, but you're not going to get outprinted by Simon & Schuster, Random House, or Penguin. You can figure that out. The hard part is to take a new idea and to figure out how to put that idea in front of people who want to buy it. And so the old model was partner with the bookstore and then the bookstore will talk to people who just walked in to buy a book, which is the juiciest pond filled with fish for someone who is looking to catch a fish. They're already in the bookstore asking, what's new? What should I read? That's not the way it works at Amazon. So now the question is, is it in our interest for publishers to consolidate? Alert listeners know that I am no fan of Monopoly that once we start taking choices away, once we let producers off the hook, they gain too much power, that instead of asking what's good for our customers, they start asking what's good for us, because they can. And so, ideally, what would be great for our culture, for people who want to write and for people who want to read, is lots and lots of publishers on equal footing bidding against each other with lots and lots of authors seeking to serve them, and then lots and lots of sellers, perhaps 10, 20 sellers on the internet playing under fair conditions, all selling to compete with one another. That is sort of an idealized free market scenario. But there's a network effect, and there's lock-in. Now, once you own a Kindle, you're going to buy your books on Amazon. Once you're an Audible listener, you're going to use your Audible credits to stick with Amazon. Once you're in Prime, it doesn't really pay for you to start looking at other places and pay shipping every single time. And it's easier to just stay where you are. It's more convenient. And Amazon has kept up its end of the bargain so far by offering unlimited selection and the best prices on books. So it's sort of ideal for the reader. You get the book tomorrow at the best price, any book you want, with free shipping. And if tomorrow isn't fast enough, you can do all of those things on Audible or Kindle right now. But what this means for the book publishers is that without their partner, the bookstore, without Amazon willing to be their partner, they have a challenge. <music> Well, one thing the big publishers are doing is they're bidding against each other for ads and promotion on Amazon. Because Amazon doesn't care who buys the ads and promotions. They sell them to the highest bidder. Well, if there are lots of bidders, that's good for Amazon, bad for the bidders. So one of the big advantages of consolidating the big publishers is they won't bid against each other on promotion. But one of the risks that authors are happy to point out is... One of the advantages of consolidating if you're the publisher or the shareholders of Bertelsmann is you don't have to bid to buy books from authors either. That if an author only has one place to sell his or her book, well, then a dollar is the best bid they're going to get because take it or leave it. There's no place else to go unless you want to publish it yourself. And so the consolidated publisher will seek eventually to not overpay for the Starbucks. Now, they've acknowledged so far that that's not what they're going to do. They're going to treat each one of their imprints as a separate independent entity and encourage them to bid against each other for the Starbucks. We will see if that continues. Number two, they can get more efficient at buying shelf space and promotion. As I mentioned, they shouldn't be bidding against each other to promote a book. That forming a cartel that works together to lower Amazon's upside will help readers and authors because it will leave more resources for things that are actually productive. Bidding up the price of attention doesn't help 
the reader. And lastly, the biggest shift, the thing that they're going to have to do, that they're doing slowly, but it's starting to work, is permission marketing. That I first wrote about this for the book industry more than 25 years ago. I sat down with people at Perigee, which is now a division of this giant corporation, and I said, you don't know who your readers are, and there's a race to see who does. And it turns out Amazon won that race. It turns out Amazon knows who all the readers are. They know what those readers want. They know what those readers like. And if the book publishers don't engage in that race, they will never, ever have a chance of catching up. But once they do know who you are and what you want, they can cater to you. The same way they used to cater to booksellers, now they need to start learning to cater to book readers to earn the privilege of delivering anticipated, personal, and relevant messages to readers who want to get them, to connect readers to one another. They're capable of doing it in a way that will run circles around Amazon if they choose to, because it's this intent and interest and openness to news that enables a book publisher to redefine what they do. They're not in the business of cutting down trees. They're not in the business of printing books. None of them print their own books. They're in the business of organizing readers, of being a channel between the author who has something to say and the reader who wants to hear what that author has to say. But this is going to require a significant shift in how they see the world. So the question is, will a consolidated company, one that creates a balance with a consolidated seller, that new entity, will they be willing to rebuild their business model at the same time they are trying to run their existing business. Because Newell Brands knows that people are going to keep buying Sharpies, and they hope that people will keep buying Mr. Coffee and Ball Jars. And they are succeeding not by changing our culture, but by creating a brand that people trust. But book publishing isn't like that, because nobody knows who publishes my book, and nobody knows who publishes any of their favorite authors. What we care about are the people like us who are reading books like we are reading. And what we want is to be connected to them. Thanks for listening to my rant. And I still think they should call the company Random Penguins.